But what we were trying to do was to entice the audience, to show to the audience that this was a film they wanted to see. Reynolds knew how to direct the eye. He knew how to capture the mood and show what was most important about that movie and that image. So his images grab the eye and don't let go. You see it on the uh, pulp novel covers that he did. You certainly see it in the movie advertising that he did. He had a natural instinct and a natural showmanship for selling, for selling what Hollywood had to offer. In the 50s, as before, big studios lavished fortunes on poster campaigns, from the modest one sheets to the gargantuan 48 sheets, eclipsing whole sides of multi-story buildings. Like movie stars, movie poster illustrators were typecast in certain styles. Brown was often given historical epics to illustrate. Spartacus, Mutiny on the Bounty, and Ben-Hur. As well as getting the likenesses of the stars, Brown could be depended on to dream up an accompanying vignette of action for the background design. Brown was especially uh, capable in this regard because he could make up as much as uh, he relied on reference. He had uh, so much experience that uh, he could almost make up anything he needed and draw it from any position he wanted. He had all these wonderful little touches and he wasn't tight and like people who airbrush, she would never use an airbrush or pick a little little hairs on the head or something like that. No way. Everything was a broad stroke. He, it, it told exactly what the person was, what he was doing. Preceding the painted key art were thumbnail sketches and comprehensive pencil studies. with big name stars like James Stewart and Rock Hudson, an art director would sketch in ovals where the faces of the actors were to be drawn. Always the size of an actor's head reflected the size of his contract with the studio. For Backlash, Richard Widmark's head was larger than Donna Reed's. In Last of the Fast Guns, Jock Mahoney was larger than Gilbert Rowland. Men's heads were almost always larger than women's. The final art was most often painted in opaque watercolor and only rarely in oil. That version might undergo endless revisions by studio brass or even be cut apart and the figures transplanted to new backgrounds by the art director. After all this, the original art and a mechanical showing the final position of credits and titles were shipped to a lithographic house to be reproduced in the cheapest possible way. The work itself remained anonymous and unsigned. The movie companies did not want to sell the poster artist. They wanted to sell the star, they wanted to sell the vehicle, they wanted to sell widescreen, whatever it was they wanted to sell. None of those included the poster artist. It was very difficult for an artist to put his personal stamp on pictures like these because they had so many requirements that had to be met and they could only be done in a realistic way. And once they became less realistic and looked more artistic, they became less effective. Uh, the producers of the films didn't want an artist's individuality to compete with the personality or the visage of the stars. And they certainly didn't want the artist to sign his work. The illustrator 
is the victim of just about everybody. He's got an art director telling him that uh, his lettering has to be this high and it has to be organized in this direction. And he has an audience that, uh, whose expectations can't be calibrated at all because it's a mass audience. It's absolutely enormous. Uh, this work is not going to be hidden away in some kind of museum. It's going to be out there in front of naive little six-year-olds in upstate New York, and it's going to be out there in front of salivating sex-crazed teenagers on their way to the drive-in, and it's going to be seen by adults, and it's going to be seen by people who walk past newsstands. And the, the ability to create something that can, in fact, perform in this world, i.e. sell a product, make people interested in what they're looking at, um, well, that's no mean task. Competition among studios and theater owners was to the death. The average number of movies released each week never slumped below 15. Because of the short runs, movie theaters depended on audiences getting familiar with their product fast. Added to this was television. The sale of TV sets doubled between 1949 and 1950. While Americans were glued to the tube, movie attendance plummeted, and scores of downtown theaters throughout the country closed and converted to restaurants, furniture stores, and bowling alleys. The effort to get the fickle movie-going public to cast off their TV trays and leave Hopalong Cassidy to fend for himself redoubled. The drive-in was born. By 1951, more than 3,000 drive-ins countrywide wooed families with in-car heaters, diaper service, and even free Bibles. Outnumbering families were teenagers who flocked to drive-ins to see movies like Love Slaves of the Amazon and I Was a Teenage Werewolf. A snappy title and an ad campaign brought them in by the car load. My partner, Jim Nicholson, was a great title man. Uh, he was a man who would have a few drinks at night, and not too much, but he'd come in the next morning and he'd say, Sam, I think I've got a great title. And I would listen with breath abated, and he would say, I was a teenage werewolf. And I knew instinctively that that was a million-dollar title going to go on a $100,000 picture. There had never been a picture with the word teenage in the title, but it fitted exactly what we were aiming at. The 50s would also produce a variety of technical innovations. Audiences could now see Buona Devil, The House of Wax, and The Charge at Feather River in 3D. There was more to come. Theater owners, bitten hard by competition from TV, pounced on sci-fi and horror films. Always you wanted to grab the eye, you wanted to tell exactly what the ticket would buy. And what the ticket would buy in the case of horror movies was usually sex, violence, and holocaust. Incredibly huge, with incredible desires for love. And of course, you wanted to show the monster as representative of that holocaust. So even if what you had in the movie looked like spaghetti on strings, what you showed in the poster was an enormously frightening creature from the id, covered with hair loaded with tentacles and uh, something far more interesting than the movie ever delivered. A giant monster 100 feet high or uh, beauty by day and lusting queen by night. And they spoke to that, that same sense of larger than life, something really dangerous and strange that you're going to see here. And they really drew people in. But we came back. We came back week after week. And it was largely the posters that drew us in. Um, despite the clear evidence of our own eyes and experience that these films were virtually all alike, somehow or another you'd get outside after this black and white experience and the color poster and 
these uh, marvelous uh, actions and the fact that the, the monsters are always huge, of course, and they never actually turn out to be quite so big. I can remember Godzilla posters, for example, that advertise this monster is actually big, <laughs> so that you would go. Generally speaking, the posters had something to do with the movies, but, uh, and there were some cases, as a matter of fact, where the posters brought out something new where we actually went back and would shoot an extra scene. Uh, but there were, of course, times, and that's true of every company, when they exaggerate. Let's, let's just say they exaggerate. Not mislead, really, but just exaggerate. A film should be exciting, just that. You can do almost anything to an audience except bore them. And uh, the advertising campaign should be even more exciting than the film. There were some exhibitors, more than one as a matter of fact, who would say to me, Sam, you ought to put sprocket holes in the posters and throw the pictures away. Which he meant well, I, th I think he meant well. Publicity stunts associated with the horror genre flourished throughout the decade. William Castle, B-movie horror king, dominated the period with numberless promotions, all of them outrageous. Among them, the Fright Break, which offered refunds for cowards who could not face the last terrifying moments of homicidal. The Lloyds of London life insurance policy that protected your family if you were frightened to death at the movies. And Castle's magnum opus, Percepto, in which buzzers on the theater seats delivered a jolt of electricity when the tingler appeared on screen. This was an age in which more than 600 UFO sightings each year of the decade came to life in a great invasion of B-movies. One scientist dared investigate the incredible phenomena. Our pet dog reverted to an antediluvian wolf. Look at those teeth. That dog is a throwback. Now, before your very eyes, see a man revert to a half-human anthropoid from the dawn of creation. A monster leaving behind a trail of death and destruction. Oh, it's impossible. Nobody's got a footprint like that. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It's unfortunate and tragic that I have to teach this committee the that's basic not principles the of Americanism. That's not the question. It was also an age in which the national uproar over communism would spawn a rash of anti-communist movies, including The Iron Curtain, The Red Menace, and I Married a Communist. And because it was clear that to be a communist was also to be an atheist, there was an outbreak of religious epics. David and Bathsheba, the Egyptian, Land of the Pharaohs, the Ten Commandments, and King of Kings, which all made millions at the box office. The era was also dominated by riots over integration at Little Rock, the dreaded fear of polio, and the national obsession with nuclear war. With the knowledge of the first atomic explosions to guide us, our chances for survival will be far better than those of the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, if we act on our knowledge and are prepared. Select the basement wall nearest the probable target area of your city. If the house is blown over, it will most likely fall away from this wall. In Betty's school, they are talking about the atomic bomb too. Betty is asking her teacher, how can we tell when the atomic bomb may explode? And a teacher is explaining that there are two kinds of attack, with warning and without any warning. America's sublimated fears and paranoias were no less than inspirations to the feature film treadmill. To studio illustrators like Randall Brown, the country's obsessions were often filtered through a movie title, Attack of the Puppet People, Atomic Submarine, or the incredible shrinking man. 
Another factor that makes the movie poster so fascinating is that it creates a sort of mythological world. And in that mythological world, American innocence, uh, full of potential fecundity, uh, are menaced from uh, alien quarters. I mean, you can imagine this as Russians. Uh, you can imagine it's red Chinese. Um, you can imagine it's the kind of monsters from outer space that haunted the national imagination in the 1950s. And we wanted